ESPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that's always up to speed with the latest Formula One news. Follow us on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Daly and Kevin Laramang. Hey everybody, what is up? Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that is always up to speed with Formula One racing. I'm your host, Mark Daly, and tonight I am not joined by Kevin Laramie. Kevin is off doing other things, namely preparing for a wedding. And I'm joined instead by a couple of other gentlemen, Josh Shimizu and Kevin Wynn. Gentlemen, welcome to the show for this first ever round table. I guess, well, not quite a round table, but round table for all intents and purposes. So welcome aboard, guys. Uh, More right. like a triangle. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so first Virtual of all, triangle. Yeah. So guys, first of all, why don't you just uh, introduce yourselves, uh, Josh? Yes. Um, well, I'm on Twitter as Mayor of Shimtown, and uh, I've been a, an F1 fan since 1991. Uh, it was Nelson Piquet and Benetton Ford that got me into the sport, as well as my friend uh, who was a a uh, exchange student at uh, my high school here in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. He uh, introduced me to it, and his name was Jean-Michel from France, so I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Very cool. Kevin, what about yourself? Uh, where, when did you first get into to racing? Because I, I know we could go off onto an IndyCar tangent, so we'll try and stay focused this evening on uh, on F1, but where do, <laughs> wh- what's your connection to F1? Um, my connection to F1 is pretty much since 1990, so a year before Josh. Um, I was uh, actually McLaren all the way up until Lewis left. Um, I was never, uh, you know, I, I respected um, Mansell's uh, drive with Williams, but that was as far as it got. And uh, when they introduced Lewis in t- 2007, I was all aboard that train and I've been on that train uh, ever since. You know, that's uh, very cool. In 2007, my wife and I went to Japan for a holiday and just walking around from the streets of Tokyo at the time, there were tons of billboards with Lewis Hamilton in his uh, McLaren racing gear. And I knew then that if fail everything else, Lewis was going to be big in Japan, which is, hey, that's that's pretty cool in and of, uh, of itself. But uh, just before we, we talk about the uh, what's going on in the current state of Formula One, all the latest news, the Spanish Grand Prix and all that, I was going through my timeline on Twitter last night, and I saw something that I absolutely have to have. And for car geeks out there, it is a McLaren MP44 Haynes manual. So basically the manual you need to take apart and rebuild a McLaren MP44, which I guess would be, what, a 1986 <laughs> uh, McLaren? 80, I, 86, yeah. yeah. Which uh, is, in my opinion, one of the sexiest cars ever built. And without a doubt, as soon as I'm able to get my hands on that, as soon as that hits Amazon, I'm ordering that one. <laughs> that That's a must-have. <laughs> Well, that's an ambitious task. <laughs> well, I got the book, then just somehow I'd need to get my hands on the car, which may prove a little bit more difficult than ordering a Haynes manual off of off of Amazon.com. So, guys, we just completed the fifth round of the Formula One World Championship this past Sunday. Who can believe it? It seems like we were just gearing up for Australia a couple of weeks ago. We're already five rounds into a 21 race season. And, well, let's just put it this way, guys. If you're not a fan of Lewis Hamilton, Mercedes, or Valtteri Bottas, are you not maybe feeling a little bit nervous after what we saw over this past weekend? Josh? Well, yes. Um, it seems as though Mercedes has gained a lot of momentum. Um, and it it's kind of weird because it seemed Ferrari had, had the advantage. But any time that Mercedes gets a 1-2 finish, it kind of feels like the writing is on the wall. Does that make sense? It does, absolutely. Yeah, Kevin, well, what was your takeaway from the Grand Prix this past weekend? I was I was team Mercedes, so you know, a one two finish is you know right up right up the alley. It's um, right in the wheelhouse. Um, I was really surprised though that there was a twenty twenty and a half second gap. Um, from Lewis to Valtteri. And, I mean, 
I think there was only one other time bet- during the sort of Mercedes era that um, Hamilton and Rosberg were that far apart. So um, I don't know where the speed came from, but you know, if it lasts for the rest of the season, fifth title for, for Hamilton then. Yeah, part of it, I think, comes from the fact that uh, Hamilton was able to pit and get new, fresh tires, and uh, Valtteri had to stay out there and, and do tire saving, though. Pretty much the last, what is it, third to half of the race? Yeah, I can't remember how much, uh, how many miles or laps he had on those tires, but uh, by the end, but Lewis definitely had the uh, the the advantage there. The one head scratcher that I thought was when uh, Sebastian Vettel came in for that unplanned or maybe spur of the moment second pit stop, <laughs> which honestly. I thought when they tried the undercut at the beginning of the race, I thought, okay, well, from from a tactics, from a strategy point of view, it makes sense because for once it seems they're taking it to uh, Mercedes rather than reacting to what Lewis is doing or what Valtteri is doing. But that second one under the virtual safety car made no sense. And then coming out behind Max Verstappen on a track where these guys can basically drive with their eyes closed and it's fairly difficult to get around in certain places. You just had to think at that point, barring some sort of incident or mechanical failure for Verstappen that Vettel was going to have his work uh, cut out. But the thing was, he couldn't even keep up with Verstappen even after he lost his end plate driving in the back wheel of the Williams. Kevin? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, what's really interesting is um, that second pit stop, they... They asked uh, Sebastian, you know, was it a mistake? Was it a strategy mis- uh, miscue or whatever? And he said that it was planned. And I do not think that was planned. I, I think he's um, saving face. I think he's um, making excuses for the team. Um, because up, up to this point, all the strategy calls have been in his favor. So, you know, what? if it's going to go against him, then... He has to say something to keep to keep that level. I'm I'm seeming to remember that when he went in for that pit stop, he was uh, hindered by somebody because they had to wait for somebody to pit before he could get out, so they didn't have an unsafe release. Or was that IndyCar? <laughs> no. Well, it, both of his pit stops were slow. I mean, the first one was four seconds. The last, the second one was five and a half. Yeah, five and a half. So I think somebody was coming into the pit, uh, and so they had to hold him there for a second before he was able to go out. Do, do you guys remember that? No, I don't actually, but it would explain a, a little bit why it it didn't really work out for him, which I thought was interesting because after the Australian Grand Prix, when it was kind of the other way around, when he miraculously took the lead over Lewis Hamilton when he pitted under the virtual safety car then, I thought it was uh, I thought it was very ironic that it should turn out that way. Not that he was challenging Lewis for the lead, mind you, but he definitely uh, got uh, or he lost out on his podium, which I think kind of summed up uh, Ferrari's entire race afternoon. They they looked like at one point in qualifying that they might just have it, and then Mercedes does what Mercedes does best and ended up with the front row lockout, their first one since Abu Dhabi of last year. But the race, it wasn't uh, wasn't even really close. I mean, all credit to Vettel to uh, to, to really stick it to, to Valtteri and stick his nose up the inside into turn one. And, well, that wasn't really the big talking point of the first lap. And let's touch on that now. And the big talking point was, of course, was uh, Grosjean spinning in going into turn three, I believe it was. I can't remember who it was in front of him. I, I think got a little out of shape and Grosjean uh, overreacted, ended up uh, spinning off of the track and... And then decided to put his foot right to the floor, <laughs> spun around, created a giant smoke screen, and proceeded to take out Pierre Gasly and Nikon Hulkenberg. And thank goodness he didn't take out the rest of the field behind him. Oh my god! Oh, Guys, that's hilarious! It was. Uh, was that not a WTF moment or what? That yeah. was a WTF moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, Grosjean, of course, has been uh, penalized three grid places uh, for Monaco in a couple of weeks' time. And I I know that the team, I know that Haas Racing is doing the right thing by coming out and standing by their guy, but I'm kind of getting to the point that... I've reached the con- the conclusion about Grosjean that he's been in Formula One long enough, and that if it hasn't happened by now, I don't think it's going to happen for him ever. I mean that the last two races definitely were not the best examples of uh, what what, what Roman can do. Josh, well, if you're a superstitious person, I, yeah, that's got to get to your head. I mean, um, I think I said on Twitter that um, 
if he's not developing a complex or if Haas isn't developing a complex right now, they they probably should be <laughs> in his case. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at the race results, uh, his teammate, Kevin Magnuson, who had, well, by his standards, <clears throat> excuse me, a very quiet race, ended up in, uh, in P6. So he had to think that if they could have had both cars finish, that a, a top 10 or a, a double top 10 finish was on the, the, the cards for Haas. So, I, mm-hmm. excuse me, again, uh, a very disappointing uh, results uh, for them. Kevin, where do you think they go from here? Um, let's see. I wrote on Twitter that um, I, I, I posted a meme that basically said that, uh, what's his name, uh, Esteban Gutierrez is coming back. And, you know, I, I, I wrote that as a joke, but now that I think about it, now that I've had, you know, time to, to really analyze his uh, screw-ups over, uh, over the last two uh, Grand Prix, I think it's time for Haas to say, you want enough. Because, like you said, he's been in F1 long enough. He's not exactly, you know, Pastor Maldonado, but he's getting there. Because <laughs> uh, you can't take out two two people um, by running back onto the racing line. That was, his, that was his, his entire defense, that he couldn't do anything to, you know... Mi- mitigate that which is absolute you know yes because he was off the racing line on the outside corner and he accelerates back onto it back onto traffic where they're going side by side uh one two and he says that i can't do anything what well yeah i mean the thing is it, it seems to be like, like case, like you say, he's not quite as bad as Crash from uh, Maldonado, but he's not really all that far off. And when you think about it, I mean, they definitely seem to have a decent car this year. I mean, their third year in Formula One, obviously that 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 first year in in 2016, those first what three or four races or whatever it was, was a bit of an anomaly. And then of course they kind of regressed to where everybody expected a first year Formula One team to be. Last year, I think, was a, a little bit. I, for me, I didn't think that Haas really took the step I was really expecting them to. And then this year, the the signs were very promising. And then just to to see that they have what uh, appears to be a a competitive car by, well, midfield standards at any rate is is disappointing. So you you hinted at uh, Esteban Gutierrez, if Roman Grosjean does not come back to Haas Racing. Let's just look in the crystal ball here. For, For 2019, who would you guys like to see driving alongside Kevin Magnussen, assuming he's back next year, which I think he probably is? Wow, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think, um, oh gosh, I had this, I had some uh, names in mind, uh, and I, gosh, I put them on, on Twitter, of course. See, we're better at, uh, I'm better at typing than I am speaking and thinking out loud. So I've got to think about who, I mean, we, there was there was the talk about you know getting either Rossi or New Garden from IndyCar to just let them have a chance and see if Haas could do anything with them. But you know, as much as I would like that, it seems that that is a a, a long shot. I mean, a, a, a huge long shot. So within Formula One, it's a good question. If if Haas were a factory team, I would say get Ricciardo. Mm-hmm. But Ricciardo wants to he wants a championship. So, I mean, it's either he stays at um, Red Bull or he goes to Reno or something like that. But I don't know. Maybe he could be open-minded enough to, you know, to consider Haas uh, because they are kind of the top of the midfield right now. But my doubt is is that they're not a factory team. They're not a works team. So they're, the chances of them uh, giving Ricciardo a, a championship are slim. So... While I wish Ricky Ardo could go to someone like Haas and show you know show what he can do with a team like that, uh, I think that'd be great. But it's it's a long shot. So to, so talking about Danny Rick now, obviously he's out of contract at the end of the year, and he's kind of hinted that. Well, I mean he hasn't kind of hinted, but he has uh, been pretty overt in his statements that uh, he's looking around. And 
what with uh, Raikkonen out of contract at the end of the year and uh, Valtteri Bottas in an option year at Mercedes, you got to think that those are the two obvious ones that he's going to be trying to get. I mean, if, if you're Danny Rick, you're probably texting your agent every five minutes telling him to do whatever it takes to get him into one of those two cars because... <laughs> Honestly, it really appears that, uh, well, obviously, if you're in a Mercedes, you've got a pretty damn good uh, chance of winning a championship. Uh, that's that's pretty obvious. Ferrari, a bit of an outsider, but there's the, the, the lure and the mystique of the Scuderia that uh, is, I think, a draw to a lot of drivers. But... I don't know. I would. Uh, I would think that uh, with the way that uh, that the Mercedes is right now, Botas. I think uh, just going back a couple of races to Bahrain when uh, Vettel won that race, I thought that he didn't really push enough. I don't think he really tried to challenge enough to win that one when Seb's tires were going off and he was hanging on by the skin of his teeth. And and Kevin, what did you make of that uh, that race? Do you think, not just that race in Bahrain, for example, but do you think that uh, Valtteri's done enough to challenge for a championship in his year and a bit at Mercedes so far? I think he has because um, there's, there's a very good rapport between him and Hamilton and, you know, the fact that Hamilton was late to the Baku uh, uh, podium to console his teammate, which he has, which he never did with uh, Rosberg, is really telling. Um, and you know, if it wasn't for that uh, DNF uh, in Azerbaijan, you know, he would be leading the championship right now. So um, I think he's done enough to, you know, get that option year. Um, I think Mercedes doesn't change, um, but uh, you know, there's there's always um, you know the the junior teams, so to speak, um, Force India and and whatnot. Um, that I think um, Genrick might potentially go into um, if we're talking midfielders. Uh, I would put Danny Rick into a Force India and see. What, what he can do with that Mercedes engine. Um, but let me throw a name out for you guys. Um, at Haas, I would put Marcus Erickson. In wow. Cuba. Interesting. Wow. That, that's, that's, that's a brave call, <laughs> my friends. And, uh. let me, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because Marcus Erickson has been with Sauber since 2015, right? And he's hasn't been mind-blowing he hasn't you know been um crashy but he's he's been solid he hasn't you know retired he hasn't retired you know every other race um he's finished he's kept his car out of the barriers um i think he's a solid option i i just hate the fact that people look down upon him because he is a quote-unquote pay driver and I mean, we talked about this, uh, at, you know, ad nauseum uh, that Schumacher was a pay driver, that, um, you know, PK was a, um, was a pay driver. So you can't really put the blame on that, on that label. So I, I say put uh, Erickson into Haas, see what he can do with, um, with Kevin and see if that, uh, if the Nordic countries can actually put uh, the U.S. team back on front. Well, that reminds me actually of, of uh, what I was reading and also um, listening to on another podcast that uh, somebody said that there was a possibility that Verline could come back and take that hot seat, which, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I personally, I think that would be a, a good move in the sense that he knows the tracks um, and that he had promise at uh, Zauber, but um, just didn't have the car to do anything with it. And I'm wondering if, it, do, you, do you guys think if he had the seat at Haas, uh, he could actually show us what he's all about? Who, who Pascal no. Verlein? Pascal no, Verlein, yeah. No, yeah. No, uh, well, no, no. Wait, wait. Go ahead. Tell me why. Okay, because here's, here's two reasons. One, it's because... If you put Haas and Verline together, um, what's the connection between them? Wh one is Ferrari, the other is Mercedes. It's kind of like adding oil to water, right? 
Well, I, he's a driver's a driver. I, I'm a, a driver's about? a driver, but he's he was brought up through the Mercedes system, so okay. it's it's kind of like if you have is it been because you'd have to buy him out. Is that right? The, Partly so that, but you know, also because um, there's. Like I said, there's no first of all, there's no ties uh, between him and uh, in Hess. But more uh, more importantly, um, if he was good enough uh, to begin with, he would have he would have a seat right now. But instead, he's back in DTM. So, yeah, actually, that that's a very good point, Kevin. But the one young guy that I've got my eyes on the moment is uh, Charles Leclerc. I mean, he's proving. Uh, not only that he's faster than his teammate, who's uh, the the aforementioned uh, Marcus Ericsson, who we should mention did finally get into the top ten in Bahrain a couple of uh, weeks ago. So I mean, good for him. I mean, and and Leclerc, he's showing race in race out that he belongs in Formula One. And I mean, here he was. He he finished uh, what was it uh, in P10 this past weekend uh, again in in Spain. So when you even look at the constructors' championship. Sauber is now currently ninth out of tenth. Okay, that's maybe not that great, but for them, that's a thing. And they're actually not on the bottom. They actually have more points than the very, very, very sad and pathetic Williams <laughs> Mercedes team, who only have four. And they're only two points off of uh, Toro Rosso, who, of course, got a, a whole heap of uh, points in Bahrain when uh, Gasly finished, what was it, P4 in that race as well? P4. Yeah, and I mean, they're, they're not even really all that far behind teams like Force India or, or Haas. Haas is uh, sixth in the constructors at the moment with 19 points. So there's kind of a bit of a, uh, not quite a log jam in that bottom half of the constructors championship, but in Sauber obviously proving that now they have a car that actually has an engine designed for the set specifications <laughs> of, of the same year is, is proving to be uh, somewhat decent and somewhat uh, competitive. I mean, you could make the argument, okay, well, Leclerc, that's not really all that impressive because he was two laps behind, but he was not the only guy two laps behind. Uh, I think it was uh, Sergio Perez finished P9 in Spain. He was two laps down. So I think that's uh, quite promising. And for uh, I, I know that Ferrari typically don't give chances to, uh, to young drivers. But if he's going to get uh, the job done with a, a, a lower team and a partner team like Sauber Ferrari... You have to wonder if maybe he gets a couple of years under his belt there. Who knows? Maybe two, three years down the road, possibly before he's knocking on the door of the big team and maybe jumping into the into a scarlet clad car rather than the uh, Alfa Romeo liveried Sauber Ferrari. What do you guys think? Well, I think uh, yeah, I think that's a great uh, idea. Um, as you said, you, you said that he, you want uh, he may. Or, or wait, wait. You said that he would possibly, he could possibly be a good fit for Haas. Is that correct? Um, well, actually, uh, no. I was thinking maybe for the for for the works for the Scuderia team a couple of years down oh, okay. the road. You know, honestly, I mean, I was thinking about Haas could, like earlier this week, but then I thought, well, considering how Sauber is right now, it would, to a certain extent, be a bit of a lateral move, don't you think, uh, Josh? Inter well, it's interesting that you brought up Haas for Leclerc. Well, I, that's what I thought you said. Um, <laughs> because it seems as though Haas is kind of an intermediary or intermediate step. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So if you were at Sauber, Zauber, that's kind of like a Ferrari, Ferrari badge to Alfa Romeo. But, um, you know, if Grosjean doesn't work out, I think that's a logical step. And I, I, I tend to agree with you about that if Haas is kind of like an intermediate Ferrari team um, that would be a great step um, and I think he would br uh, bring uh, some positive energy to that team whereas Grosjean seems to be up and down he fluctuates with his emotions quite a bit um, I mean if you saw him on the broadcast last Sunday and he was sitting on the steps I, it seemed like a defeated individual or a defeated driver so um, I'm going to actually keep Leclerc in the back of my mind for Haas, although I do believe he's going to go to Ferrari sooner than later. Yeah, that's let, interesting. Let me throw out um, the potential uh, 2019 lineup for you. Um, so I have at Ferrari, I have Vettel, Ricardo for 19 and 20. Uh, and then I have at uh, Haas, Ericsson, and 
Magnuson. And then I put for, um, you know, for, you know, just because he's there, um, I say some, for some reason, let's say uh, Peter Sauberg gives uh, Verlein a second chance. So he goes back to Haas, <laughs> or mm. sorry, he goes back to Sauberg in a, you know, current engine car, see what he can do. If he can, if he can, you know, make it, um, move up to Force India and join, uh, join, um, what is this? Uh, George Russell, who takes over for uh, Sergio Perez. And Sergio goes to, let's say, McLaren. Thoughts? Interesting. That was a lot of information <laughs> to take in. <laughs> The, the, there's uh, some definitely some some interesting ones there. I could, you know, I'm talking about uh, Ferrari. I could uh, honestly see a Vettel Ricardo lineup uh, next year. I, I think that it seems a bit of a stretch, maybe not a stretch, yeah. but it just seems unlikely that uh, that Raikkonen is going to come back. I mean, he's been on a one year deal for what the last three years now. Three and, years, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it seems to me unlikely that they'll they'll bring him back for a fourth year like that when when there seems to be plenty of other options out there. Although I guess uh, it would uh, maybe it would come down to, to money. I think that Raikkonen's getting what somewhere between six and seven million a year, and I think uh, Ricardo wants something significantly more than that. But I guess when it comes to maybe having a, a competitive team, then somebody to push uh, Sebastian Vettel, maybe for a team like Ferrari, maybe uh, a demand like that from Ricardo would not be outrageous. I don't know. What are you guys' thoughts? I tend to think that uh, Ferrari is going to stick with the formula that they have right now. Um, I know people say Raikkonen's getting old and uh, that he's uh, kind of on his last legs, but I still think he's got a lot of fight in him. I mean, uh, with um, his qualifying performances this year, he hasn't been a slouch, you know. He's kind of been in the fight uh, the entire time, so... Uh, that would be my opinion that I think they're going to just stick with this formula because they work well together. Uh, they work as a team and if they're going to get Vettel a, a, a championship, um, I'm, I tend to lean towards that pairing. So you're saying that if to get Sebastian, his first Ferrari championship, he <laughs> needs a, he needs a, he needs a nice teammate. Well, copacetic, meaning that uh, they're not going to be emotional, that kind of thing. Um, I guess Rick, Rick, Ricciardo is a good teammate, uh, if you look at him and Verstappen. But in the I mean, back of my mind, I still have the pair back at Red Bull. And uh, uh, Ricciardo, um, what is it called? Uh, outperforming Vettel. I don't know if that would happen in this situation because time has passed and I think Vettel has adjusted to the formula a little bit better at Ferrari. But I just think it's such a close pairing um, and uh, just something in the back of my mind is unsettled about that. I mean, there's also the fact that Danny wants, uh, what, two years, 36 million, so 18, 18 a year for the next... Uh, two years, and as of right now, it's he's saying that he wants either a Merck or a Ferrari. So, um, like I said, I don't think uh, Mercedes are going to change. Um, I think eighteen million a year for a driver that can win outside of the top ten, or sorry, out of the uh, top two spots, um, is well worth it. Um, I can kind of see where you're going with um, that was last year at Red Bull and being completely shown up. But um, I think uh, a Vettel Ricardo at Red Bull or sorry, at a Ferrari pairing would be immensely entertaining. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> and um, it would be, you know, just great for the sport because you have a differing uh, 
pair. You have Vettel, who on the one hand is very straight laced, very um, you know technical. Where you have on the other hand, you have Ricardo, who is uh, goofy, but you know once he puts that helmet down, he's all business, and that I think that's that's better than a stoic Kimmy all the time. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. You got to love Kimmy, though. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Kimmy is a legend. Especially a Ferrari. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's been around for years. He's kind of been there and done that. And he's obviously a world champion. But I, I don't know. I kind of agree with Josh. Uh, I think that uh, that Raikkonen has been getting it done to a certain uh, degree, especially in qualifying. He's had a bit of bad luck this year as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and politics uh, can seem to rule, obviously. And uh, the, the number one driver's always favored. I mean, last year, go back to the Hungarian Grand Prix where Vettel got in front and kind of just drove around <laughs> for the end mm-hmm. uh, Vettel when he was uh, in second place when Kimi was no. leading the race and, Absolutely. and things like that. So, And this past weekend, he retires uh, due to a mechanical issue. So it, 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 I feel for the guy because I, mean, <laughs> I think he's still quick. I think he's still quick. And I don't, I don't want to be the guy that's uh, sort of leading the charge with the pitchforks to, 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 <laughs> to push about a Ferrari if he could still still get the, the job done. I know while, while we were talking, it seemed unlikely that, uh, or at least our consensus, that uh, we could see a Hamilton-Ricardo partnership in Mercedes next year. But uh, just sort of theoretically speaking, what do you guys think of that dynamic? Um, do you think that a Ricardo-Hamilton uh, partnership at Mercedes could work. I mean, obviously, uh, we we've seen Ricardo or sorry, uh, Hamilton and and Botas get along quite uh, well together, and uh, Ricardo is obviously a very different personality than uh, Valtteri Botas, and obviously a very different personality than uh, Nico Rosberg, who was basically in open warfare with <laughs> Lewis Hamilton for several <laughs> years. Yeah. Of those wonderful, wonderful years, I miss them. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, long, uh, long are the uh, long gone are the days of uh, punting each other off at uh, turn four at uh, Barcelona and <laughs> exactly. Spa 2014 and uh, all the Austria. Uh, yeah, Austria. <laughs> it just it, it was it was almost uh, for if you as long as you weren't a fan of either driver or Mercedes, it was almost like the gift that ke- ke- kept on giving. <laughs> <laughs> that know, was just, heartbreaking, man. Well, which, which was uh, Kevin? Because Kevin, because Kevin is a, a Hamilton fan. Oh yeah, it's, right. Yeah. It's it is heartbreaking. <laughs> heartbreaking all the way to to four world championships, nonetheless. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, that's consolation. But I mean, um, to get to get us back on track, um, Hamilton Ricardo, I would love to see that. Actually, I would love to see that, but uh, I don't. I think there's a there's a line i think that you know how um rossberg and hamilton lasted up until basically uh monaco uh i think that's as far as the ricardo hamilton relationship will last on track Mm -hmm. because i wonder because i you know ricciardo seems to have been uh, a good teammate to everybody so are you saying possibly that it could come from the Hamilton if it's too close it could come from the Hamilton side or do you think both of them may have issues with each other well I mean if you have yeah. if you have um, two very competitive drivers um, they're gonna be like you know what I want to go out first I want to be uh, first on on track for qualifying or you know if I have um, better track position let me pit so I think that dynamic is going to play out a lot if that if this pairing happens. But also, it's because when you put basically two pit bulls together, they're going to be like, you know what? They're going to be straining at the leash. And I just don't think that Total Wolf has enough patience to deal with another, um, you know, Hamilton Rosberg type of. Uh, dynamic and it, I, I agree with that last uh, that last statement. Yeah, I don't think Mercedes wants to have another war between their uh, drivers. And uh, yeah, but I would love to see Ricciardo uh, take the fight to Hamilton. And I, I think Ricciardo, you know, from Ricciardo's side, I think it'd be fine. Um, I'm not sure about Hamilton's, but I think Hamilton by this time in his career. Uh, really wants that type of fight. And I think the only way he's going to get that fight, even though Ferrari's not out of it, we know Ferrari's not out of it yet. But um, 
to really have somebody take the fight to Hamilton in a Mercedes, it has to be a driver in the team, uh, in Mercedes, fighting with Hamilton, just like Rosberg did. That's my opinion. So I would love to see that. Did you guys not get the feeling at the the Spanish Grand Prix last weekend, Ricardo, who finished uh, a little bit down in the order uh, in fifth uh, position, did you not think that right at the very end of the race there, he was making a statement and just sort of advertising the fact that he was there? He set a track and a race uh, and the, the race fastest lap of a 118.441 and just a lap uh, earlier uh, a couple laps before that Vettel had set a fastest lap of 119.128 so Danny Ricardo <laughs> just blowing that track record out of the water and I thought for me that was a, a statement because he was behind Max at one point I think he was maybe fourth or fifth and he was on the radio and uh, he was saying come on I've got uh, I've got the faster car you know uh, I don't think he said uh, let let me buy but I think he was uh, hinting at uh, at the team to, to let him go as as it sort of turned out obviously Max did have the 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 faster car, but I thought it was kind of interesting, and I thought that that was just a, a way to kind of underline what uh, was otherwise a fairly quiet afternoon for himself. But let, let's get away now from uh, from the, the talk of uh, drivers and contracts and things like that, and and let's get a little bit kind of like tech nerdy, if you want to call it that. Uh, obviously, when the the teams come back to to start the European season, that's when you typically see the first round of upgrades to the cars, and the most noticeable upgrade to any of the teams for me at any rate was the introduction of the new nose and front wing for McLaren and I don't know what did you guys think I don't think it had the effect that (laughs) perhaps that they wanted because uh, of course uh, they didn't really seem to improve at least for my money guys what do you think Um, I think it I mean comic value is very high with that that wing and nose oh yeah Um, absolutely but uh, you know what when you when you see it in in motion, um, going around turn two and into turn three around Barcelona, it does stick to the to the road more. Um, at least when Alonso is driving it. Um, the only issue I have with it is, and I wrote this on Twitter, that the little side veins that create that gap will that will push down on the car but there's no where there's nowhere for the for the air to go so you're just going to create a low pressure system all the time and i just don't understand why they put that you know those two uh triangular veins on the bottom of the front wing and i think that might be an issue for um you know monza i might they, they might uh improve it for monza i don't know um but i think it's a front. It, I think it's a heavy downforce wing. Um, so we'll see how they improve it. Um, but as of right now, um, it yeah, I, I agree. It didn't work all that well in Barcelona, but maybe it will in Monaco because that is high downforce, high uh, high power, um, or sorry, high high downforce, low power, um, and maybe it, it will suck into the ground sucking the ground more i don't know josh what was your takeaway from the uh, the upgrades for mclaren this past weekend obviously alonso finished in uh, p8 and his teammate stoffel van dorn did not finish the race uh but again it wasn't really uh really impressive qualifying they were middle of the field again alonso was uh in eighth starting the race and his teammate um, van dorn was a uh, p11 uh what were your takeaways from from their upgrades impressed or not impressed or is it a wait and see? Well, it didn't seem to have the effect that they were looking for. <clears throat> but you know, I I'm not gonna I'm gonna try not to make any assumptions, uh, and maybe just say that they're maybe they're going in the right, the right direction, but they have to. You know the saying: it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh-huh. Uh, that seems like what it's going to be like. Um, not that it's going to get uh, a lot worse, but um, as they start to add more things onto it, I hope I hope they improve. But I'm not really holding my breath. 
uh, but I'm trying to remain optimistic about McLaren. Yeah, and, and don't you just get the, the, the feeling that each and every day that the writing is on the wall for Fernando in Formula One, it, it sure seems that that the hints have been pre- pretty obvious that uh, he's uh, about ready to, to call it a day on his Formula One career, don't you think? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I, I think he goes to um, endurance racing next year. Yeah, I, I think he has to. I mean, I, I think that he's been very brave to stick it out the past few years with McLaren and obviously the whole troubles that they had with the, with the Honda engines. And this year, I mean, honestly, the uh, they, they've got a, a more powerful engine in the Renault, but they're still, I, I think, obviously a step behind the works Renault team. And that's not all to do with the engine. So I don't know what the problem is with the car itself, but I, I don't think that the, the problems that they're still having performance wise can be completely a hundred percent blacked or, or blamed on the engine or lack of power, which tends to be a bit of the go-to excuse or the go-to complaint for Christian Horner and <laughs> Red Bull. I think since what about 2014, that's always been his number one thing. Oh, well, you know, the Renault engine is underpowered or the tag Hoyer branded Renault engine. So uh, that's interesting. What is a lot? What does Alonso do? I mean, if he tr- if he really wants to stay in Formula One, where is there any recourse for him at this point besides McLaren? Is there any recourse? Probably not. I, I don't think. I mean, I, I think the the opportunity, obviously, to to go to a team like a M- Mercedes or Ferrari, that seems pretty. Like let's just call it like a long stretch, uh, a far stretch. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem likely that that would be a, a destination for him. And I think obviously he's uh, proven uh, himself in Formula One. Obviously, he'd like to get that third world title. But honestly, guys, I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. Sadly. Yeah. Well, did did you not feel that last year and the year before, even before he went to Honda? Did didn't you feel that way? Yeah, well, I mean, when he he got out of that uh, contract that he had with Ferrari to move to McLaren, I mean, that was a, a big deal at the time, and obviously it was a, a real risk on his behalf to do that. And obviously, with the hindsight uh, or having the benefit of hindsight being uh, twenty twenty, that that move just didn't work out as uh, <laughs> anticipated. Uh, sadly for Fernando, that I, I think that that was his. That, I think that we could look back in years from now when he's uh, retired or left Formula One, say that so that move to McLaren was basically the last giving up on his last shot uh, at a world championship. Which, you know, it's sad to say, because, I mean, uh, when he won two in a row there, what was it, 2005, 2006? I mean, it looked like he was uh, set up to be the guy for, for years to come, and it just didn't uh, didn't work out that way. Mm-hmm. I think um, with Hamilton being his teammate in 2007, I think that was the beginning of the end for Fernando, because he was shown up by a rookie, so yeah. he left for uh, Ferrari, right? Um, there was all this talk of, you know what, I'm going to bring back um, the glory of Michael Schumacher. Um, and he never delivered. Um, he almost delivered, I guess, in uh, 2012 and 2013. But um, there's, I feel like there's, there's always a point in time where in terms of managerial decisions, um, Hamilton hit, hit it right on the spot. He went to McLaren and he got out when he got out, and that was perfect. And Alonso, he goes from he sells high, but you know he doesn't. He when he goes down, um, he goes down really low. And I think um, his two worst decisions were leaving Renault in '06 uh, for. McLaren the first time and then um, leaving Ferrari for McLaren um, in 2014. So, you know, just uh, talking a little bit about uh, or, or Fernando and McLaren in, uh, in those uh, days about uh, a decade ago, we all know how toxic and how tough the relationship between uh, Nico and uh, Lewis was <laughs> in Mercedes the past couple <laughs> of years. But I mean, dial it back 10 years earlier and there were some pretty frosty moments between Fernando and Lewis at that time as well. And, and Lewis, of course, obviously prevailed. And who would have thought that uh, he would have chased off uh, a guy like Fernando Alonso at, the, at that point in time? But hey, 
things haven't turned out for Lewis in such a bad way. He's turned out to be a pretty good driver in his own right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 27 from Michael Schumacher's uh, 91 wins. So. Yeah, I mean, the sky is the limit. It's going to be really interesting watching the, the next couple of years. Obviously, Vettel's still got uh, quite a few years left in his career. And Lewis, I think that's the, the, the big question now, kind of to, to bring this whole conversation full circle is, uh, it looks like, even though it's been taking some time, that they've, uh, I wouldn't say be, or been uh, dragging their heels, Mercedes and uh, Lewis Hamilton's camp, but they've been saying, of course, is they wanted to get the distraction away from contract talks and, and concentrate more on developing the car and getting the car right and challenging for the season. Sure, whatever. I, I guess at the end of the day, if you're a Lewis fan, the, the, the whole point of it is get the, the deal done whenever it gets done. I mean, there, there's no pressure to get it done right now, I suppose, but... I really wonder if maybe we see a couple more years from Lewis. I, I think that, you know, that uh, that whole 2021 date, what with the, the whole change in what could happen after the current rules and regulations and agreements all come to an end at the end of 2020. I think for me, that seems kind of like what could be a logical kind of place for Lewis to maybe call it a day. What do you Possibly. Guys think? Yeah. Possibly. I mean, it seems like everything would uh would be it, it's it's indicating that everything's going to be vastly different in 2021 and i mean he's already proven at this point even right now with four world championships that he's basically accomplished everything that he ever could possibly want to do in formula one so with everything turning on its head in a couple of years would you really want to stick around when you're already well i wouldn't say an old man but an old man <laughs> by formula one standards <laughs> how old is he going to be in 2021 36 yeah 36 okay all right i i, so I don't he, know that that would seem to me to to be about a, a good time to uh to, to call it a call it a career in f1 i mean give it a couple more years and under the the the, the regulations and the type of cars that you're familiar with and then uh walk out with your head held high and who knows maybe you'll be able to win a couple more championships uh, before it's all said and done well if jansen button is any indication yeah i think I think that would be a good time to, to retire. Yeah. The, the only said, problem, sorry. Oh, he said that he, he stretched it out for one year too long. He's 38 now. And, uh, I believe he was 37 or th probably 37 when he officially retired when, when he had no more, uh, connection with McLaren. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be a good indicator of yeah. just, you know what? I've had a great, I've had a great career. Um, and it's time to let others have their day. Yeah. And I think that when he does retire, I don't think he's going to do, say, like uh, Jensen or, say, Felipe Massa, who's just uh, signed a deal to race in Formula E. I think that he just gets up and uh, and walks away from racing altogether. I think that Lewis obviously has lots of different interests uh, away from the track, away from racing. And I think that uh, when it's all said and done, I think he just walks away and, and does whatever Lewis wants to do with the rest of his life, which should be kind of crazy to think i mean uh, it's kind of hard to, yeah. to 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 think uh of what formula one would be with uh, like without him but you could make that same argument with uh fernando and possibly kimmy and some of these guys that we could see leaving the the, the sport <laughs> in the next uh, couple of years but just before we start to, to wrap this one up guys just uh, looking over the the drivers standings in the world championship so far this year lewis hamilton on top 95 points leading sebastian vettel who's got 78 Val Terry Botas, third place with 58. Kimi Raikkonen, 48 points, only a point ahead of Danny Rick, who's got 47. Uh, Max Verstappen rounds out the top six with 33. And he's only a point ahead of uh, Fernando, who's in uh, seventh uh, position. So wh why don't we just uh, wrap it up here with one final topic, guys. And five races into the season, who has been your most surprising driver? Who do you think uh, stood out maybe a little bit more than the, everyone else? Kevin? I would say Leclerc, but that's because um, I knew he was, you know, a star since um, F2. But if we're talking about the top six, then I would definitely say Verstappen, despite the fact that every single race he's hit someone. <laughs> um, because, you know, he has the talent, he has the speed, he has everything that you want in a driver. It's just that maturity factor... And knowing when to go in, take, when to take a gap, when not take a gap, 
um, that um, has cost him. And I think once he learns that, um, maybe maybe after the summer break, um, he might uh, make a make a decent charge to the top three. Cool, Josh. Who's been uh, your standout driver of the year so far? Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi. Okay, going with the uh, the old fellow. We're going both uh, both ends of the spectrum here. Well, well yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he, you know people say he's at the end of his uh, career, and that uh, uh, and 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 especially last year, people. Well, people talk about him in the sense that he, if he gets behind, then he stays behind. If he, um, if he gets screwed by Ferrari or whatever in a in a strategy call, he just gives up or whatever. And it doesn't seem that way this year. It seems like every qualifying, he's really going for it. Um, and maybe he's found something in the car that he didn't have before, or maybe his engineers, you know, have been able to give him something in the car that he hadn't had before. But I, I've been impressed with, uh, the way he's been able to qualify and kind of keep fighting his attitude about even when he does, it seems like he gets shafted. Uh, he still has a pretty good attitude. So, um, can you reckon him? Cool. I, I'm going a little bit more on Kevin's side with uh, Charles Leclerc, but I'm also going to give a shout out to uh, Pierre Gasly from the point that he had a very impressive Grand Prix at, uh, at Bahrain and then's had a little bit of uh, bad luck in some races since. So I wouldn't say that he's stood out in a performance and results kind of way as Le Leclerc has, but I think he's grabbed my attention with that uh, that P4 in Bahrain kind of thing. Okay, this this guy's been able to do something with which should not be, honestly, one of the top running cars and has kind of made me wonder... Was that just a bit of a fluky weekend? And for some bizarre reason, that Toro Rosso was oddly suited and uber competitive at, at Bahrain and perhaps nowhere else. So I'd like to be able to see if uh, Gasly could uh, recreate some of that magic from uh, from from this point forward. But hey, guys, thank you so much for jumping onto the pod this week. We'll have to do it again sometime. But uh, before we all hang up and go our different ways here, uh, why don't you just uh, let you let everybody know where they can find you on Twitter, Josh? Yeah, you can find me at Mayor of Shimtown, S H I M T O W N. And basically, that's just uh, a play on the mayor of Hinchtown, who's in IndyCar. It was just a joke, but it uh, kind of took off, and so I can't change it. So those right. are sometimes the, the the very best Twitter handles, or the <laughs> ones that have a bit of a hidden a hidden meaning to them. Kevin, what about yourself? Where can everybody find you on uh, online on social media on Twitter? So yeah, you can find me on Twitter at just Kevy K E V I E, uh, all one word. Um, I'm usually there. Or tweeting at um, IndyCar theorists, IC theorists, um, over for all IndyCar stuff. Cool. And of course, you can follow this podcast on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and my personal account at Mark JR Daily. And that's a daily with an L E Y at the end. And uh, jump in, join the conversation. Josh, Kevin, myself, and Daniel, and many other people are usually online most days out of the week talking Formula One, talking IndyCar, talking occasionally Harry Potter and other random <laughs> topics that have oh, nothing to do with <laughs> racing, but uh, are usually amusing and entertaining nonetheless. Guys, thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll catch you again very, very soon. And until next time... Have a great day, great evening, great morning, wherever you are. Thanks for listening to the Scuderia F1 podcast. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, then head over to ScuderiaF1Pod.com. Want to get in touch with us? Then email us at ScuderiaF1Pod at gmail.com. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us, sportspodcastingnetwork.com.